All right, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, thanks so much for tuning in for another community conversation. Uh, my name is Brandon Middleton, and on the behalf of the Siebel Center for Design at the University of Illinois in Urbana in Champaign, uh, I'd like to welcome you to a community conversation with uh, two esteemed guests. I will pass the popcorn over to Case Lorenz and to Ingrid Brown in a few minutes here, but let me share my screen and just give a little bit of an orientation just in case this is the very, very first time you are rocking with us. So we are in week four of this community conversation series. And what we're doing in this class, which is called Introduction to Social Design, is basically introducing students at the U of I and community members to the concepts of design, design thinking, and human-centered design on the one hand, but then also talking about the power of social impact and uh, nonprofit work and community organizations who work really, really hard to bring some of the uh, design skills that we're talking about into tactical and practical ways that the community uh, can use them. So we're really excited to um, highlight a number of organizations uh, throughout the course of this 16 week semester. And uh, we'll hear from uh, a number of backgrounds and uh, hopefully you'll leave fuller and more informed uh, than you came in the door. So with that said, uh, here's our agenda for today. We'll do the quick overview, we'll do some special guest introductions, and then we'll jump into a uh, fireside Q&A type of chat. Uh, like always, if you've got any questions, uh, burning questions that you'd like to ask for our special guests, feel free to utilize the chat. Feel free to use the emojis and all the faces and things that Zoom makes available to you throughout the course of this as well, if you'd like. And uh, yeah, we'll have a nice uh, free form conversation, uh, share some stories, share some of our journeys, and hopefully uh, folks take away a couple of gems and uh, good things to put in their back pockets. All right, so with that, uh, again, a quick introduction. I'm one of the co-instructors uh, for this course called Introduction to Social Design. Uh, these are three contexts that I live in right now. Uh, professional Brandon, I work at Amazon Web Services by day. Uh, family Brandon, uh, I've got uh, my hands full, as you can see in the picture, dad and uh, husband. And then community Brandon uh, puts a smile on my face to try to give back to the community. I received a lot of help uh, as a young person uh, to get to where I'm at and uh, have the intention to give back to the community as well. And um, I'd like to hand it over to my co-instructor, Bert, to just say hi to the people as well. Uh, Bert, what's up, man? Hey, people. Uh, I'm Bert. I am a lecturer at Siebel Center for Design, uh, co-teaching this uh, course with Brandon. Um, I am also an amateur type designer, and a lot of my background is in interactive arts. So that's why you see a little funky piano there. Uh, and that's about it for me. Perfect. Thank you. Thank you, Bert. All right. We'll fast forward one slide and um, just give a lot of love to the organizations that have said yes as we reached out to the local Urbana and Champaign community. Uh, we wanted to, again, not just talk about these organizations and the kind of impacts that they have, but actually learn from operators and learn from, uh, you know, directors and executive directors in these programs to, to learn about how we as designers might be able to partner up and, and help to volunteer to make an impact in our local and then more broad uh, community. So again, today we've got um, bottom right there, children's home and aid in the house. Uh, really excited uh, to, to have Ingrid join us. Uh, but over the course of this 16 weeks, we'll actually hear from every single one of these organizations that are on this slide here. All right, so just a quick recap. Uh, this is number four, but in week one, we had uh, Devaris Brown and Lynn Canfield join us, um, two UIUC ex-math nerds. Uh, talked about a number of different things. Uh, we had week two, Sajud and uh, Tunde join us. Um, you know, great conversation as well. Last week, we heard from uh, Jason Maiden and um, had an amazing, you know, conversation and designer's, you know, journey from his early days at Nike all the way through uh, what he's doing at Fear of God right now. And then this week, we've got uh, Ingrid Brown, we've got Case with us. So with that, because I'm getting tired of hearing myself talk. I'm gonna pass the popcorn over to you, Ingrid. Feel free to take two or three minutes to just intro yourself, 
who you are, where you are, what you're focused on these days. And then after that, we'll pass the popcorn over to Case. So Ingrid, take it away. Sounds good. Thank you for that introduction. And thanks for allowing me to join you. I, it, I, I feel very honored to be a part of this, this process and to, to be here. So thank you, Brandon. Um, you and um, I'm Ingrid Brown. I am a program manager at Children's Home and Aid. I have had various positions at Children's Home and Aid since I started in 2008. I'm going to date myself a little bit here. Um, to I'm currently working with early childhood home visiting, um, and I, I work with the supervisors who have teams of home visitors that are meeting in the homes of children and families. Um, I previously worked in child welfare, so foster care, adoption, um, intact family services, licensing, kind of the, that whole array um, of, of service, I suppose. Um, I live in Bloomington. Um, I, I work with teams in Bloomington and DeKalb, um, but I live in Bloomington. I'm married. I have two little boys. Uh, so also busy. I get that, Brandon, um, too. And, and um, yeah, I'm a UIUC alum. So I have my undergraduate and, and graduate degree from, from the U of I. And, and so again, I giving back in any way that I can, Brandon, I get that um, too, because people have been very generous to me and I've been got given a lot of opportunities. So um, I, I want to help um, and mentor folks whenever and however I can. So thanks again. Excellent. Excellent. And you're very welcome. Like uh, salute to you and the work that you've been doing from 2008 all the way to now and, and beyond. So thanks for joining us. Uh, now I'd like to pass the popcorn over to Case Lorenz, um, role model of mine from a long, long time ago. Really, really good to uh, come full circle and have you here. Uh, Case, same thing. Feel free to take a couple of minutes to introduce yourself and tell uh, the folks on the call here what you're up to. Sure. Well, uh, thanks for having me, first of all, and really impressed to see this uh, phenomenal class and group of people you've put together. So congrats to you. Uh, in terms of my background, um, Lex Shares is Chief Executive Officer. Um, Lex Shares is a commercial litigation finance company uh, based in Boston and Manhattan. Um, as CEO, I'm responsible for guiding the company's strategy and direction, scaling technology operations and investment originations, and expanding access to strategic capital. Um, I joined Lex Shares after my firm, uh, Chicago-based private equity firm, Brockhurst Capital Partners, made a majority investment in the company. And fired, prior to founding Brockhurst, um, I was focused on specialty finance, venture capital investing, um, and that was at Invest Detroit Ventures, OCA Ventures, and Hyde Park Venture Partners in the Midwest. Uh, before beginning my investment career, I helped lead software engineering teams through the $240 million IPO of R1RCM, the $1.8 billion acquisition of Coyote Logistics uh, by UPS, and the $400 million acquisition of B-Swift by Aetna. Uh, in terms of academic background, graduated summa cum laude in computer engineering from U of I in Urbana-Champaign and concentrated in finance at the University of Chicago Booth School of Business, where I earned my MBA with honors. Beautiful. That's something, um, again, you, you could see why he was my role model back uh, in, in undergrad. <laughs> uh, congrats on all the success and um, looking forward to, to jumping into some good conversation here and hopefully students for the U of I students that are in the audience. Um, as we ask these questions, again, this is a great way for you to start to uh, paint a picture for what your future could look like, both on the kind of business and technical like engineering side, and then also in the, in the community um, on the social impact side as well. So what I'd love to do is jump into some, some of the prepared questions that we, we talked through uh, Ingrid and Case, and then students, again, feel free to leverage the chat. Community members, if you're in here, feel free to leverage the chat, and we'll get through all of the questions uh, in as much detail as we can. So uh, let's go back down memory lane and just take it back to where it got started. So like Ingrid, like walk us through, you know, did four, five, six-year-old Ingrid like know that she was going to be doing the, the work that you do right now and focused on the this uh, the space that you're in right now. Give us a, kind of a history lesson of sorts. Take us through uh, what you were thinking, what you're up to, like in your formative years early on. Sure. Um, no, four or five, six year old Ingrid did not know this. I wanted to be a pediatrician, so I guess not too far off. I have a lot of like kid medical books. I think my parents were hopeful that I, I would become a doctor 
sorry um, to disappoint anyone, but um, I grew up in a small town, Hoopston, um, Illinois. So it's right on the Indiana border, about 55 miles um, northeast of Champaign, if folks are familiar with that um, too. It was a very, again, small town, um, very homogeneous in every way um, too. So I grew up with the same people um, that I graduated high school with, you know, small class of a hundred people um, too. And it was, it was a bit of a big fish in a small pond. So it was very um, interesting going to the U of I um, and, and being a very small fish in this very large pond um, too, if you will. Um, my undergrad degree is actually um, in business. So it's business administration. I had a, a concentration in organizational administration and I, I thought I would be doing something business related, but on the people aspect of, of, of things. And then, you know, I, I chose, I guess, to, to get, to get, I applied for my MBA and my MSW and I decided to go the MSW route. I, something was um, calling me towards that. And I, I believe social work is a calling and the work that I've, I've been doing, um, I've always been interested in and, and understanding of and compassionate for people and their situations. And, and the town I grew up in, it, there there were a lot of disparities in terms of the families um, that there, and, and I didn't really realize that at the time, but looking back and now how it presents um, to in terms of income levels and socioeconomic status kind of in general. And so um, my mother was an educator, my, my, and, and, and did very well in her career. And so I got to see what that looked like. And she also in that role was very helpful in the community. And so I, I think I, I kind of learned some of that um, from them. She always said, don't become a teacher. You're not going to get the recognition. You're not going to get the pay. You're not going to get any of it. So I decided to become a social worker, which is probably even worse <laughs> too in that regard. But um, I love what I do. I'm so proud of what I do and the work that I've done and the people that I've come across in it um, too. And yeah, very humble beginnings, I, I, I would say. No, thank you for that. That's the background and the context is always good. Uh, this, this past week in lecture, we were talking about uh, interviewing skills and like getting to know uh, the audience or the demographic that we wanted to design for. So the importance of kind of knowing the back, the background and the context and the backstory uh, as inputs to what we as designers are going to be focused on. And outside of interviewing, we also touched on storyboarding and visual storytelling and narrative. So uh, Case, I'll pass the popcorn over to you for some of that same question, like take us back in the day. Um, how are uh, the formative years for you, did you always kind of envision yourself doing what you're doing today, or has it been a little bit more of a windy road than what you had planned? I'd say I've been a tech-enabled entrepreneur the whole way through. Um, grew up in family businesses, had my own businesses. I launched in elementary school, middle school, high school, undergrad, um, and before computer engineering, you know, I was on my Texas Instruments calculator back in the TI-82, TI-85 days and uh, learning assembly. And, and uh, I think the binomial expansion, you know, plugging in the input variables and having them pop out. So that was me as a kid. Um, you know, I went to a summer camp at University of, uh, of Illinois probably when I was in seventh or eighth grade. And they took us to the mall and gave everybody a stipend of $100 and said, have fun and we'll meet you back tomorrow for classes. Mm -hmm. And when everybody bought CDs and clothes, I bought a book on Visual Basic 5. So that was, <laughs> that was me as a kid. Um, and so the whole way through, I've just been focusing on building up my skills and uh, following my passions pretty much. Yeah, to extend that, like we know that capital and business have a lot of say and a big role to play in how uh, social impact is delivered to uh, the communities and to like the nation and to the world that we live in. Um, double click really quickly on like how you found a way like within business or within technology to uh, give to the things that you care about and um, you know the communities that help to, to nurture you case. Sure well I've been a um, mentor formally and informally for a lot of different business accelerators, incubators, things like that over the years, um, guest speaking roles at, you know, U of I, Chicago Booth, Kellogg, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and I'm, I'm more than just a panelist. When I speak at these events, I always, you know, leave an extra 30 to 60 minutes to hang out and, and meet people and network and really dig deep. 
um, prospective student events at Booth when I was there, prospective student events at U of I when I was there. Uh, it's always been more meaningful to me to take what I learn and pass it on to someone else. Uh, it's almost more exciting than using it for myself. So, you know, I don't think that's a moment in time. I think that's really a philosophy of, um, and I'll get into this in one of our upcoming questions. I think just having a teaching mindset, you're going to add so much value in the world over the years. Yeah, love it, love it. Um, and then Ingrid, to come over to you in terms of um, the specific type of social impact that you're delivering, like we in the class have talked about uh, violence and poverty and climate change and like a number of the factors that are impacting like our world and like the next generation. Um, in terms of kind of sensitivity and delivering excellence to the people that you are um, you know, working with day in and day out, what are some of the things that have sustained you, you know, 2008 to now is not a short amount of time. Like what are some nuggets that you might share with the students in terms of uh, staying inspired, staying motivated, uh, the thing that gets you out of bed every day? I, I don't know. Um, no, I, I think the thing for me, and I wish I was more intentional about it, I guess, just in general, because I know so many people that are, but I feel like I've kind of just done it. Um, and I've been able to compartmentalize too, because the work that I do, especially in child welfare, but even now in the families that that we encounter um, too in, in the current program, um, you know, and in, in really now focusing on the prevention of child abuse and neglect, as opposed to, you know, I was working very closely with families that where they did, where the children experienced abuse and neglect directly. And so trying to, to prevent or avoid that and how important that is. And, and there's some heavy stuff that comes along with that. And to think of, um, you know, the children of families that I've gotten to work with throughout the years. And, and I mean, they're impact, impacted by poverty, like you said, um, you know, mental health issues, um, substance abuse issues, um, you know, kind of just anything and everything you can kind of think of that would be difficult. Trauma, um, you know, we, I've, I've, I have a lot of training on trauma and how it impacts children, especially, but, but families and over time, how that prolonged stress can, can alter a person and in their brain and, and how they, they function in the world. And so um, I think I've been able to, for the sake of my mental health um, too, and now, especially as a working mom um, too, is just having to like, this is work and I go home and I get to spend time with my family um, too. And, and I have a supportive partner, thank goodness, um, you know, that we share household responsibilities and, and parenting, but there's, there's a mental um, load of, of being a working mom and how I still have to compartmentalize even within my home um, to that. I think I've just learned over time and I, I, I got good at doing it very early on because I had to, it was more of a survival sort of thing for me because I loved what I was doing um, um, and, and wanted to make that impact in the community. Yeah, I think necessity kind of breeds like ingenuity when it comes to design sometimes and that you've got to just like uh, plan and prototype and throw something that's it's not perfect out and off of the cliff and see if it flies and if it does and great and if it doesn't then you kind of go back to the to the drawing board and prototype it again um, you know v1 goes to v2 and then you try it out uh, in a new format so that's that's great um, maybe to to humanize y'all a little bit more and to understand a little bit more about the background and the context like we mentioned children we mentioned uh, a couple of things but tell us like a couple of fun facts, like things you like to do off cycle, outside of work, and um, you know maybe experiences that you've had that have helped to shape um, the balance that you seek, or like uh, just giving you some uh, really good insight into how you bring uh, change in, in the work that you're doing. So, in case I'll go to you uh, with just like some fun facts about yourself, like outside of work, what are you up to? Um, how do you achieve that balance. And then uh, Ingrid, I'll come back around to you just for some, some more context and some more background. Sure. Um, I enjoy traveling. So in addition to the computer engineering degree I got at U of I, I had a second degree in Spanish, actually. So uh, from a young age, I wanted to be able to appreciate other cultures and interact with people that only spoke other languages. Um, so I took Spanish 
I lived in Spain for a year. I lived in Mexico for a year while I was at U of I actually. Um, and I traveled throughout Latin America and Spain and places like that uh, currently as often as I can. Um, recently, I had a trip to, to South America and it's, it's really rejuvenating and humbling and educating to speak to others, understand their culture, their political system, their values, and go beyond the language to really expanding your perspective on everything. Um, and so that's, that's really something that helps me relax and something that helps me uh, expand my perspective on my life, my family life, and how I interact with others um, cross-cutting. I love that. Uh, tell me just uh, something that I've experienced and seen a, a little bit of. When you kind of go into another country and people are expecting you to speak, you know, English to them or like to uh, come at them one way and then you show that you are able to converse in, in their native language with them. Talk about like the respect earned and the like what it what it does for you in terms of um uh, giving yourself a little bit more credibility and uh, respect earned in that particular culture. I think as designers is something that when we talk about empathy and like seeing ourselves in other people's shoes is a very important point. Um, well, certainly I think they appreciate the effort to, to meet them where they are, so to speak. Um, but something I'd probably highlight here more so is uh, you have to be humble and, and able to make mistakes. Um, and that's as true in life as it is in a foreign language in a foreign country. So, you know, you have to be brave enough to say things the wrong way to, to, you know, you mean to say Apple and you accidentally say grandmother or whatever the case is. Um, the experience of, of jumping out there and trying your best and having people see that you're making the effort, even if you're making mistakes, that'll not just serve you in language, but that'll serve you in business and in your personal life and everywhere. So, um, one foundational thing for me throughout my life has always been, if, if you're never failing, if you're never making mistakes, you're not trying hard enough, you're not trying new things. Yeah. And w one more double click into um, the thing that kind of put your mind in a spot where you were dreaming of, you know, going to those countries where like your parents uh, pushing you or did like formative experiences as a kid kind of open your mind up to those kind of ideas and possibilities like talk to me a little bit about that so where i grew up in the south suburbs of chicago uh there were some spanish-speaking people in the community and in our school mm. so i won't say they were in the majority there were a few of them but right there at a young age i was able to see there's there's more here than what's in my neighborhood when i get off the school bus right um and from a very very young age i said well if i can speak english and communicate with everybody in my neighborhood, what if I could speak Spanish and communicate with everybody in those neighborhoods, right? And actually, when I lived in Mexico, I took French for a couple quarters also. So I, you know, I went to France for a while and I spoke with people in French and you know, many more mistakes in French than in Spanish, but that's what I'm there for. Um, you know, I went to Italy and, and London and Paris when I was in high school with my Spanish teacher. And I was the only student that signed up for the trip. It was the two of us traveling between those three countries. Mm -hmm. So from, from a young age, I've always said, you know, there's a big world out there and I just want to experience it and be part of it and contribute to it. Yeah, I love it. Uh, I'm picking up bravery. I'm picking up, you know, failure and uh, resilience from those things. So thank you, Case, for, for, for those comments. I'll come over to you, Ingrid, uh, with a similar question about, you know, outside of work, what are some of the more meaningful things that uh, you've been able to take hold of that'll bring you some balance uh, with, with kids running around. I don't know if uh, <laughs> your answers might be a little bit different, but uh, I'll give you some time to, to respond to that same question. Uh, sure. Yes. And that's, I feel like with, with young kids and boys, especially, you know, a lot of what I do these days is um, very kid centric um, too, but that's fun too. And getting to kind of experience or re-experience things, um, through their eyes, it's been just a really incredible um, experience um, as a parent to do that. And um, I actually, before I moved to Bloomington, I was living in Chicago in the city uh, for 10 years and lived in different neighborhoods throughout the city and, and just loved that. I, you know, coming from a small town, you know, I, I knew, Kate, Case, like you said too, like I wanted to do something bigger and, and be exposed to more people and, and learn um, about them. And so that was a really great opportunity for me. And I, I, I just, I love city living. I love the pace of it. I loved um, the people and 
trying to be a bright spot in that because it wasn't, you know, not everyone was necessarily, um, you know, they were maybe not as welcoming, you know, in my experiences as they were in, in my small town where you knew everybody and you knew everybody's business about it um, too. But, but in this city, I loved, you know, live music and just especially small venues and some, you know, funky, chic restaurants and trying kind of the latest thing. And I mean, any eating and drinking kind of anything and everything um, too. So that was a really just just such a great experience for me to to live there and to really live it um too and um now i mean I, i'm not traveling anywhere exotic my husband has family in texas so we go to austin and houston a lot and i love i love those areas um too and i i work out um i I tried to work out. Um, I like running and, and um, I recently started listening to audiobooks. I know people have been doing this for a long time, but I, I'm not a reader and I want to be one. And this is the only way I can figure out like how to do it and make it work in my schedule um, too. And I played Euchre last night for the first time in probably 25 years. And so I think I want to like get into card playing. Like I, I'm just this whole new person. So, um, so that's, yeah, creating that balance or trying to find, you know, I like spending time with my friends. I like spending time with my family and my husband's family. So I'm very blessed in terms of the people in my life and, and having access to them. Love it. Love it. In terms of, um, you know, you hear a thread of kind of putting yourself in other people's shoes and can conversing and building relationships. So like for the students and the community members out there, uh, as we talked about, like interviewing this week and storyboarding what you hear as you gather data and try to synthesize it, um, you know, the, the questions that we put out to Case and Ingrid are like literally like hitting the, the ball right on the head there where, you, you know, you have to immerse yourself in something as opposed to just getting a sprinkle of it on you in order to get the more full experience and the more, uh, you know, full sense of empathy for the problem that you're trying to design around or uh, the community that you're trying to solve for. So yeah, I appreciate that. And uh, again, a prompt to anybody that's out there, if you want to put questions into the chat, uh, feel free to go ahead and do that. But uh, we'll keep plugging away in case I'll come back to you in terms of kind of the, the, the inspiration and the motivation question. Um, who are some, some people or what are some places that you go in order to um, get motivated to kind of get through the day or to stretch and expand your thinking? You, you mentioned like um, immersing yourselves in other cultures, but in terms of, I don't know if they're, they're authors that you follow or podcasts or different places where you can go and say, hey, this will shake me up and this will get me in a good spot to uh, to lead more effectively, to, you know, pass down strategy and ideas to my team. Uh, give the students a sense for like what your process is to kind of draw more inspiration, more motivation and uh, a diversity of thought so that it's not just you in, in, in your own head. Sure. So I'd say probably literally every day I consume at least an hour or two of content on YouTube around topics such as self-discipline, intrinsic motivation, finding happiness internally, centering yourself, um, taking me time in the morning before you get started, having frameworks on how to view life and relationships. Um, I just think defining your values really guides you in life. And I don't know that that's a popular thing to do, um, but if you know what you stand for, the impact you wanna have on the world, um, it really connect, helps you connect your passion to your job and to your relationships and everything else. Um, so I would say, rather than a specific YouTube channel or, or a specific author, it's really those topics. I look at a lot of different people's viewpoints on those topics to really get a well-rounded um, war chest of knowledge to try to think about how I wanna live my life and how I wanna move through the world and interact with others. Yeah, love it, love it. Um, same question over to you, Ingrid, in terms of like, uh inspiration motivation like diversity of viewpoints that you can put into your own mind to try to um come at your work in a way that's you know empathetic and that's going to be most useful to to your demographic and to your audience what do you think sure um i i'm fortunate in the position that i am and especially in early childhood home visiting there are a lot of opportunities for for training and professional development, um, especially again, as it relates to trauma, um, but also, um, you know, parent-child interactions and maximizing those. And, um, 
you know, even like, well, child abuse and neglect prevention, but but even school readiness sort of thing. So um, preparing this younger generation for living in our world. Um, so I get a lot of that and some great content through that. Um, but I am pretty basic in terms of, you know, my, again, my audio books and my podcast, but Brene Brown, um, how inspiring her um, Unlocking Us podcast is. Um, Dr. Nadine Burke Harris, um, she does a lot of work around ACEs, which are adverse childhood experiences and how childhood trauma um, affects a person across their lifetime, um, especially their health. Um, I just discovered uh, Priya Parker, who has a book that's called The Art of Gathering, How, it, how We Meet and Why It Matters, um, which has been really impactful for me. And um, I, I, I'm in a lot of meetings. I host a lot of meetings um, with the people I work with, and that's been um, influential in, in how I do that and, and making it meaningful. Um, Instagram, I, I, I do my fair share of, you know, I'm not looking at like, I, I'm looking at a lot of different things, but um, <laughs> too, um, it's called So um, Period Informed and people probably know about this, but that has been really helpful for me because it really breaks down some complex issues. Um, and that's the description, I guess, of, of the account um, too. And so it's pretty progressive in terms of its thoughts, but it's, it's revisiting things that you thought you kind of knew about American history um, too and giving you a different perspective on it. Um, Ooh, and you have a an Instagram, so I will be scrolling through that as well now too. So, um, I yeah, just trying to figure out what are the best avenues for me to get information that I can use and that are that's helpful to me as a person, but especially in my role and um, working with the people that I do with the topics that that we cover and the, and the people that we serve. Yeah, I love that. And since you mentioned Instagram, like yes, like you know, this inside outside concept of uh, higher education and the interface between it and the community interface between it and, you know, corporate America and business. Um, I see people on all sides of those. And it's interesting to be able to try to connect with people in a different way. And I think the pandemic and COVID has forced us to. So the fact that a class at a university has its own kind of public facing Instagram channel and we're like trying to invite the local community to learn alongside us and to participate with us is just an out of the box idea that, you know, uh, I had and that Bert was supportive of as well. So I, I'll come around maybe back to that same question around how, in terms of how you've delivered and how you've led through this, you know, last couple of years, maybe Case, I'll come to you and ask, the question about just how's your leadership your leadership style changed or how have you designed life in a different way than you were living it you know prior to what march of 2020 and then ingrid i'll come to you like i'm, I'm imagining that trying to serve families and children is a lot different in these last couple of years than it was before that so yeah talk, talk to me about the how you've changed and how you've had to adapt uh to design you know, your day to day? Uh, that's an interesting question. I mean, a lot of things have changed in the last few years, right? I'd say one is one is empathy and putting yourself in the other person's shoes. Um, let's see. It's really just connecting with people. I mean, when I go to hire somebody for a role, for example, how do you make sure that it's the best fit and it's the best outcome? I have to really understand that person's motivations, which means I have to be able to empathize with them, know what their professional goals are, know what their personal goals are, know how this ties into their one-year plan, their three, five, 10-year plan. And that really takes you in a different direction when you're interviewing somebody than the standard questions you might Google and find, right? And so that's in the hiring context. If you take it to the context of your existing team or your family, especially in these times right now, I think it, you know, the work itself is de-emphasized and the people is more of the area of focus. And I find that if you, you get what you give, right? When you're a parent and you have a child, you get what you give. When you're a friend and you have a friend, you get what you give. When you're an employer or a team leader, you get what you give. And so I think it, 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 it makes sense to take a 30 minute meeting and make it a 35 minute meeting if that extra five minutes builds on the people side of the equation. Um, you know, if you look at my career over the last five, 10 years, this was one of the turning points that really ramped up the success is me saying, let's not make it about me, let's make it about them and us. And if you're gonna propose a partnership, it shouldn't be a question mark in my mind, why is this 
proposal valuable to the other person. It should be screaming in my mind why they would be interested in this. Otherwise, don't waste their time. And that's not really something that a lot of people think through, I think, especially if you're starting a business, you're trying to grow a business, you're hungry to get business development partnerships, you're hungry to hire and build your team as fast as you can. But you have to really take time and say what's in it for the other person, because not only will they get better results, you'll get better results, but they'll actually have a better time and you'll have a better time. Yeah, the experience is so important now. And, um, you know, I'm sure all of us have been affected in certain ways, maybe having lost somebody or having a family dynamic change that uh, when you remember back, you know, work, community life, family life, uh, those moments where somebody extended you kind of the human response or asked you the question that might not have been, uh, you know, politically correct to ask or notice that you seem to need a little bit of extra of something uh, seems to be the difference between whether, you know, you might take a job with somebody on their team or whether you might, you know, continue looking. Um, you know, this past week, I've seen layoffs on LinkedIn and different kind of things in the news happening. And uh, those things really, really matter. And I think case at the top of uh, an entire organization, you could probably speak pretty authoritatively on those things there. Yeah. Let me let me throw in one more nugget here while, while we're on this topic. Um, communication styles is huge, I found. Mm -hmm. um, so when you're interacting with someone in a business context, you have to stop and think what they just said to me. Let me not get hung up on the words, but think about the person and where they're coming from, because communication is a two way street and it's not just what hits my ears. It's also what left their mouth. Right. And what the, what their what left their mouth may have had the best of intentions, but maybe didn't make it to my ears the right way. Yeah, that's uh, those are some relationship bars as well. Uh, I've found that my wife perceives <laughs> uh, the words I say sometimes differently than how I intend for them to like leave my mouth. So. Uh, I think if you've got a track record of attempting to achieve something, that one slip or, you know, to Kate's point of saying a word wrong, I think uh, your intention and your history will be able to like back you up and to protect you uh, more than that one slip up in the moment. So, yeah, definitely. I, I appreciate you coming over top of that to make that point. And uh Ingrid, I'll come, come over to you now uh, to double click into the how of maybe, maybe you paint a picture for us. How were you doing the work that you were doing prior to COVID? And then how have you had to design a new way to deliver value to like this vulnerable population over the last couple of years and, you know, be a mom and do, you know, all of the other stuff that, you know, human beings have to do. I'm sure the, the students would be fascinated and maybe have some follow-up questions on this. So Ingrid, I'll give you a couple minutes. Sure. Yeah. And it's been, it's been tough to, to pivot. Um, and I was newer to home visiting. I had just come from child welfare and newer to home visiting when this pandemic hit and, you know, the world kind of changed as we know it and, and likely will never be the same. And so we've had to, to be so creative in our approach to working with families. Again, that are very vulnerable and that that don't have the same resources or we call them protective factors that that mitigate some of those challenges that they experience and um you know meeting with families virtually is very different than being with them face to face in their homes and getting to see what those interactions look like and how best to support them and you know their vulnerability compounded with all the stress you know they, they were already fragile and these are already fragile systems that that we work within and um and, and it's it's been hard and the families have struggled and we don't have we've gotten some resources grants or other sort of funding that allows us to support them the best of our abilities but um but it, it's not enough and it's not enough for the the staff who are working day in and day out tirelessly to meet the needs of these families and they're, they're experiencing struggles in their own lives. And so it's really, it's been a balance for me, I think, um, you know, supporting the mental health of my staff, because that's, that's my role. Um, and we talk so much about the parallel process. So if I can support my, the supervisors who can then support the home visitors, who can then support the, the parents who can support their children, you know, we're, we're hoping that that is all working the way it should and it, that it's working well, um, too. So I have to, no pressure, but I have to be on my game and to be as supportive as I can so that 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 trickles down, I guess, to to the kids um, too. And I think 
you know, uh, what I do is so relationship based um, and it can be exhausting at times, but, but just making sure to put in the energy so that the families get, get that from me ultimately, but <clears throat> from, from the folks that I work with. And, um, and it is hard to balance. I mean, I, I didn't have to thankfully deal with, with virtual learning. My, my son has been in kindergarten this year and has been in person the whole time. Um, thank goodness. Cause I don't know how I would have done that. And I have so much respect for people and parents that have, um, too, cause it, it was hard. <laughs> And then to add anything else on top of that just almost feels impossible. So again, supporting the mental health of my staff, but also holding them accountable to the work and making sure that that they can meet the needs, the very specific and very significant needs of their families. Yeah, that's, yeah, salute uh, to frontline workers, to all the teachers, I think uh, the police officers, firefighters, like, um, I think we live in a fast paced kind of capitalistic democratic society, but uh, to be forced to sit down and stay inside and, you know, to look around, it just makes you just appreciate kind of how hard some folks uh, have been working these last couple of years. And uh, you mentioned earlier that your mom was an educator and that she, <laughs> she kind of like warned against doing that because, you know, maybe there wasn't as much money in it, but uh, I think the current, you know, situation we're in the last two years is like forced us to put a magnifying glass um, up to kind of our society and question like, how do we get the folks who are passionate about this kind of work more resources? Um, what kind of legislation can we put in place in order to kind of protect uh, their balance and to, you know, do right by them, basically, since they're literally putting their lives on the line every single day. Uh, for us. So yeah, that's a beautiful response. And um, I'm going to shift the, the conversation a little bit. Like if I were to take you back to kind of early days, right as you're getting ready to graduate from, uh, from U of I, for both of you, uh, let's talk a little bit about like failure and putting yourself in uncomfortable situations and like just uh, starting to be able to figure things out as a young adult and an early professional. So Case, I'm gonna come to you and ask like, you know, as designers, we, we prototype things, we throw stuff off the cliff, we throw stuff at the wall, some of it sticks, some of it falls down. Uh, walk us through a couple of your, your favorite like failure stories uh, that helped you to kind of put two and two together about, oh, this is, this is kind of cool, I wanna keep doing this, or this is horrible, I, I, I don't like this line of work, or I don't like this process or this system. Uh, I think it's, it's, it's cool for us to learn again, from the successes, but then also on the other side, from some of the times we scraped our knees and we bumped our heads and it didn't work out the way we planned. Um, this is interesting. I'm gonna need a second to think about a good answer for this one, one, one moment. Okay, okay. Well, one, one example is, you know, I've started several businesses over the years one of them was telemedicine, but not telemedicine as you think of today, where it's it's prolific, it's it's pervasive. The laws have caught up to the technology. Um, this was you know, maybe 12, 15 years ago at this point. Mm -hmm. And so had all of the technology, had all of the go-to-market strategy, had none of the regulatory and compliance figured out, mm -hmm. and had none of the, the customer side figured out. So I learned the, the hard way through entrepreneurship. It's not about what I dream up in my, in my basement by myself. It's about who are the people I'm serving and what's the problem I'm solving and what's the value I'm creating. And so I, you know, I had to learn that by doing a couple of times. Um, but as soon as that light bulb clicks, it revolutionizes how you do business mm -hmm. because it's no longer about, well, what would this person pay for this product? Well, put yourself in their shoes. What would you pay for that product? You know, what would make this person select my product to put yourself in their shoes? What selection process do you go through when you're choosing whatever the product or service is? Um, and like I said before, what would make someone partner with me to help grow my business? Well, put yourself in their shoes. Um, if you had their budget and you had their concerns and you had their team and you had, you know, their set of KPIs that they're held accountable for, which is a huge one, right? If I'm going to approach somebody in a business and say, um, will you do business with me? I have to understand how they get compensated and evaluated by their superiors, because I may be doing something that I can calculate the value add for, but if 
if at the end of the year they get their review and it doesn't factor at all into what they're judged by, I have to understand that, right? And so these are things I picked up by doing. Um, and I don't, I don't really count many of them as failures. I mean, you learn by doing how to be an entrepreneur. Um, I took entrepreneurship classes. I read every book you could find, but it's not till you get out there and scrape your knees that you really, the, you know, the Lego blocks start to click together. Yeah. Yeah. I love that. And, um, no way to, you know, build expertise or who, who have you ever met that's got muscles that never like struggled <laughs> inside of the gym or, uh, or in the weight room. So yeah, very, very apropos. And I'll bring that same question over to you, Ingrid, in terms of, um, yeah, same, same, same question. Um, what are some of the things that you had to figure out early on and some of the experiments that you had to try and uh, fail at and kind of take the, maybe we won't call it a loss, but maybe just to take the lessons early on. Yeah, I mean, I just, I, I mean, too many to count, you know, and, and what, do, what do I highlight? Um, but I, I'm a firm believer in that too, that that that's made me who I am um, too. And if, if I hadn't made those mistakes or made those choices or whatever the case may have been, like I wouldn't be where I am today and I wouldn't be who I am. Um, so I, I really do do um, think everything happens for a reason, as cliche as that sounds. But, um, you know, I, I, again, my undergrad degree in business administration, I thought I needed to do something in business or related to like my coursework. And so, um, Chris, I was responding to, to your question too, I guess, in the chat, but um, to, I, I, I went into insurance sales right out of right out of college, I had no idea about insurance. Like I, nobody taught me that. I didn't learn about it necessarily. I took tons of finance and econ classes, but um, it just, I was not prepared for that. And, and I can relate to people and I knew that's, that's what I wanted to be able to do. And so, so it was probably better that I did for me uh, pursue my, my MSW at that point um, too. So that was a good choice ultimately that I made um, too. And it, and it led me to the, the people in my life, the places I've been, you know, my kids, you know, I, I, I actually worked with my husband. That's how I met him um, too. And I was um, just a kind of a side note, I was adopted and I was adopted through the agency I now work for. And so to think of how that's come full circle for me. And um, so, so many things have been circumstantial, I guess, um, too. I think of, um, I took a little break um, from um, child welfare, uh, foster care specifically, and I was working with emancipating youth in care. So kids that were aging out of the system at 21, um, Illinois DCFS, um, Department of Children and Family Services. And, and it was a great experience. And I love that population and working with them. That's not where my strengths lie. And I had to use funding that um, was given to the agency to create a program. And that's just, I, I, I didn't, that, I was working by myself. I don't work well by myself. I need to work with people and bounce ideas off of them. And so, um, Case and I, it sounds like we're very different <laughs> in that uh, too. And 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 um, so I think those are some of the highlights, I guess. But again, it then allowed me to take another role within child welfare that has now led me to what I'm doing. And I, I I'm, I'm so grateful for those things. And it does take a lot of bravery. It takes humility. It takes you know being able to say like, oh that. The, those aren't my strengths or, you know, I, I could have probably chosen a better path. Um, but, but, you know, bless the broken road or whatever that, that, you know, cheesy country song is. Um, I, and I, I, I subscribe to it. <laughs> yeah. If I could double click into, you mentioned the MSW and you mentioned like the business undergrad, like how much of a shock to your system was it to go from like econ and finance and business to kind of the hard work of social work and like, uh, just walk the students through some of um, that transition because they're, I mean, th there are two different things in my mind, right? Absolutely. Mine, mine too. Um, and it was, it was, you know, it was different people that were in my classes. It was different subjects and, and topics and ways of, of talking about them mm -hmm. um, too from my undergrad career. Um to, I took social work 101 as a senior and I, I loved the instructor. I loved and you know, the, the work and I was with a friend in the class, which makes things that much more enjoyable. Right. Uh, too, but I, it, it just, it clicked. And so I knew that I could use that in some way, whether I was working in a, in a company or an organization and, and working with the people and relating to them in whatever 
capacity. But then I knew that my, my heart was really in, you know, helping the most, the most vulnerable and, and those that are disenfranchised and, you know, whatever, whatever I needed to be able to use my strengths in, in that regard and, and advocate for the people that, that need help being advocated for. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, I, I think case you mentioned kind of the system, I didn't ask you specifically about it, but you asked us to put yourself in the shoes of the person who you're making the ask of, you know, who are they? What's their team? What's their needs? What's their selection preference? Um, so I was going to ask you a question about like systems, but I think you laid out pretty nicely, like what it will take as a designer for us to systematically walk through how to design good things, good organizations, good processes for people uh, that we are interacting with. So I'll, I'll fast forward from that question to ask you a question about um, kind of your utopian future. Like as you look into the into the future, three, five, you know, 10 years out, like you mentioned, uh, people having plans, what are some of the things that uh, you're excited about some of the things you're working towards right now, uh, some of the things that you would like to see designers, maybe the next generation, make a lot of progress on, um, you know, from where you sit. I think that everyone is better off when you know your purpose and your passion. So I think from a designer standpoint, if you're working on something you're passionate about, if you know what you're building towards in your life, what you find fulfilling and enriching, that's gonna help you um, get the most out of your life, regardless of the product you're building or the business you're building. And then if you take that same perspective for your customer and say, building on what we already said about put yourself in their shoes and understand you know, what product or service is value added for them. If you go beyond that and say, what makes them excited and energized? Now you have a raving potential customer or a raving friend, right? What, what's today, Thursday? Mm -hmm. If you're gonna go out tomorrow, Friday or Saturday with your friends, you know, go the extra mile and say, what would make this an ecstatic outing for the other people coming? I mean, just across the board, if you can connect with people's passions in the products you build and the relationships you have, even in the conversations you have, right? Um, someday you're gonna be uh, in on-campus recruiting, vying for a job. You're gonna be an applicant to a job. And you know, one thing I found is you research the interviewers before you talk with them and understand what they're passionate about. And if you just drop one nugget in that conversation about, oh, I, I've noticed that you love to ski, I love to ski. Or I noticed that you, you have a lot of pets. You know, I have a dog and my dog is really my heart. You know, you connect with somebody's passions and you really change the game. Um, so I would say, you know, do that with yourself and do that with others that you interact with. Um, and I'd also say, if you define your dreams, you'll be able to accomplish them. So take the time to know what success looks like for you and what success looks like for those around you. And you can help yourself become successful and help bring others with you. Yeah. Um, and I'd like to double click into, you mentioned um, graduated, you know, summa cum laude. And that means like you have a internal like bar of excellence and you've had to make some choices uh, along the way so as it pertains to kind of choice making and kind of surrounding yourself, or maybe you do your best work kind of in isolation when you've got time to think, um, talk to us about kind of setting um, expectations internally and then kind of building and designing the environment that you need in order to thrive since you know kind of how to get the best out of yourself. I don't know if I'd go as far as to say I know how to get the best out of myself, but, um, you know, a, a big theme here for me is I'm only competing against myself. Mm -hmm. So if I look externally, you're always going to be disappointed if you're gauging your own success and your own progress by that of others. Mm -hmm. um, so I think if you compete with yourself, you'll be more satisfied with the journey and you'll get a better outcome. Um, what do I mean by that? I mean, if I get a 90 on a test today, I'd like to get a 95 tomorrow. I'm not looking to the left and the right and asking what the people around me got. I'm asking what did I get and how satisfied am I with it? Mm. Um, if I'm building a business and I say, what revenue target do I have for this year? Well, whatever that is, I wanna grow on that for next year, right? I have a lot of friends that are entrepreneurs, CEOs, um, heavyweights in business. And to the extent that I'm you know, 
judging my progress by theirs, it's just, it's not the right way to do it. Um, so I think in everything you compete against yourself, um, you look for intrinsic motivation, um, you look for, you know, when you wake up in the morning and you ask yourself, am I going to get on the treadmill or not? Do you want an app or a friend to nudge you or do you want to nudge yourself? Mm. And if you're going to nudge yourself, why would you nudge yourself? And it's because you know what your goals are and you know what your passions are. If you want to be healthy, if you want to live a long life, if, um, um, if you realize that you can either put the time and effort and money into healthcare and fitness today, or you can put it into healthcare tomorrow, um, you know, you have to understand, you know, do I want to eat this muffin? Well, I want to do better than I did yesterday. If I had a muffin yesterday, I have an apple today. If I have an apple today, I want to have a banana and a, and a walk around the block tomorrow. And you just keep building and, and competing against yourself. I love that. And hopefully, I mean, I'm getting fired up and inspired just listening. Uh, this is, a, I, I see Ingrid, I think, taking notes. So uh, thank you, Case, for <laughs> providing that, that motivation and that inspiration for us in the community here. Um, I'll come to, to Ingrid, yeah, with, with the same question, like um, the future that you would like to see uh, realized for kind of yourself and your own family, but then to do the hard work of um, family, foster care system, uh, how it has come full circle in your own life as, as a, a person who's been adopted. Um, take us three years out, five years out, a decade out. Uh, I know we've got, you know, legislation in the past. We've got like it's lots of work to do, but like what would you like to see be accomplished here in the next uh, three, five or 10 years? Hmm. Yeah, well, you are absolutely right. I am taking notes about what Case is saying. It is very inspiring and it is um, just how how you live with your, your life with intention. And it is making me think like, I do need to, to set goals for myself. So thank you for that case um, to that, that reminder, more more concrete goals, I, I guess. Um, to I, I am really interested in the, um, there's, there's a concept called infant mental health. And I'm very interested in that um, concept. And, and especially, I think, because the emotional well-being of children, young children, and, and the staff that I work with um, to has, has never been more challenging or more important. And, and so realizing that and how can I, you know, educate people about what that is, but then support them in their work of it, um, I think is, is where I see my, my career kind of going. And, um, you know, I just, I have been given so many opportunities, especially with, with, with the different positions that I've held and, um, with the people that I've encountered and, and wanting to be able to do that and, you know, with, and for people that, that I, I, have encountered previously and, and currently and in the future. And that's, that's one thing that is really important to me because you mentioned that too, is just whether formally or informally mentoring people that are going to be doing something similar or can, can relate to my story or the things that I've done in any way um, or not, you know, to, um, to be able to guide them in that process. And I think, you know, just for, for the field that I work with, and in, um, you know, how important professional development is and capacity building and, and resilience, um, how much that's needed. Um, and, you know, and, and I think there are advocacy efforts that are being made um, too, but just, I would like to see, you know, for myself, but also for the people that I work with and those frontline folks, the direct service workers that are, are bending over backwards and going above and beyond to, to do the work is, is they need to be compensated for that and they need to be recognized for that. And, um, you know, just how, how, you know, I think of early childhood education, you know, home visiting is very important, but just, you know, supporting the, the, the people that are going to be taking care of me and us, you know, and that are going to be leading, um, the charge someday, you know, I want to be able to, to have a hand in that or impact that in some way. And so I think that's for me. And, you know, and I think of, I, I'm trying to raise young boys to be good men. And, and that's, that's, a that's hard, you know, too. And, and, and even just thinking about that in the work that I do and the choices that I make and, and how I can, I'm supporting myself in that, but then how, how I'm supporting them in, in making good choices and, you know, in exposing them to things that, that, I wasn't exposed to until ever, maybe, but even until I was 25, 30, you know, in, in my age now, I'm 40 years old and, and they're getting to do things that, that I didn't. And so just giving them those experiences 
creating new experiences for me and, and learning and growing from that and, 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 and doing the best that I can um, w- with it. Yeah. Well, I appreciate that. And, um, you know, here's to, you know, I see kind of our, our uh, government leadership kind of putting some emphasis on early childhood education on some, you know, forms of infrastructure and different things that a lot of people have been hoping for for a long time. Uh, I know some people are saying it's not enough for it's just a start, but uh, I hope to see more of that, uh, you know, in this country. And then we've got uh, a number of examples of, you know, more capitalistic and democratic places that we've looked at in the world and then more like um, socialistic and like, um, you know, different philosophies and ways to do life as human beings that have been a part of the class over these first four weeks. So it's been an interesting exploration uh, to see how um, humans make choices, how design kind of plays a part in all of that. And uh, to Casey's earlier point about travel, you know, we've been pushing folks to get outside of their comfort zones and to try to uh, collect those experiences so that they can, uh, you know, empathize with everybody that they come across in their future. So um, at this point, um, I just want to say thank you. I'm going to fast forward one slide. I know we're at the top of the hour. Uh, I'm going to stop sharing and just ask all of the students um, to come on to, to video. We'll do, we always do a little group selfie here. So we'll try to knock one of those out and uh, we'll let our guest continue on their way here. So let's see. Let's try for a selfie in about 10 seconds here. Let me get myself situated. Uh, here we go in five, in four, and <laughs> three, and two, and in one. Here we go. All right, I think I got everybody. Um, so I'll give some, you know, two minutes for like last words, uh, pass it to you, Case, and then pass it to Ingrid. Uh, we'll, we'll leave you kind of to your evenings and then wrap up as a class. But, you know, if, if you wanted to say any final things to our small group here, um, yeah, pass the popcorn to you case first and then Ingrid to close us out and then we'll, we'll get us out of here. Sure. Um, one parting thought, I would say, lean into discomfort, embrace discomfort. Um, and I'll give you a story uh, to hopefully make this more concrete. So when I graduated from University of Chicago School of Business, you know, my friends went to all the big companies you can imagine you could have access to coming out of the number one ranked business school in the country. Um, and I chose entrepreneurship. I completely sidestepped on campus recruiting and chose entrepreneurship. And I said, this is a big opportunity cost potentially, right? Because you have all these people courting the top graduates. So, you know, what makes me believe I can deal with the trials and tribulations and challenges of entrepreneurship and whatever fears or trepidations you may have. So, the last trip I went on with some of my classmates at, at, uh, at University of Chicago, we went on the ski trip up in Canada in Whistler. And the first day of skiing, naturally everybody went skiing, except for me. I took one or two friends and I went to a bridge and I said, I'm going to challenge myself to go bungee jumping for the first time in my life. And I stood there on that bridge and I felt the way you would probably feel looking over the edge of the bridge down into the canyon. And I was mortified. Um, and it really was my single biggest fear in life at that point. I said, what's the scariest thing I can think of? It's bungee jumping. And I said, if I'm going to embark on an entrepreneurial path, I have to be, uh, I have to build a repeatable process to address my fears and conquer my fears. And so I jumped off that bridge and I didn't realize when you hit the bottom, you bounce back up just as much as you fell down. And I bungeed up and down and up and down. And the whole way through, I said, you know, for the first five seconds, it was terrifying. And after that, I said I did it, even while I was still doing it. Um, and I think it's part of the journey. You know, the first step is the scariest, but there's other scary steps and you get used to it and you get better results from it. So that, that'll be my part of the book. Mic drop. I don't know that I, you know, maybe we'll just end it after Ingrid and have to just do that. <laughs> or end it there. That was good. That was really good. It made me a little anxious. I had to like, like, figure out where my, my pulse was because I, you know, thinking of bungee jumping ter- is terrified, but. Yeah, you put that on my bucket list just now, Case. I'm gonna have to, uh, you know, I've never jumped out of a plane and done the skydiving thing and I've never bungee jumped. So I might have to uh, do that before I get out of here. <laughs> <I> get <laughs> cool, good. so 
Ingrid, uh, same for you. Like if you have one or two things that you'd like to leave kind of our community of students with here, um, feel free. And then after that, I'll, I'll, I'll move to close this out. Sure. Um, you know, just, just responding, I guess, to that question um, in the, the chat about advice that you would have for students early in their college career to maximize their college, college experiences. And in case you said something about building relationships and how, again, I benefited from that immensely, but how important that is and the the connections that you make now it's a small world and I have learned that time and time again for better for worse because it in your reputation reputation precedes you so in case you mentioned that too is you know or Brandon I think that was you just in terms of like who you are and how you conduct yourself with people is so important and that is going to speak to the things that you do so you make you make a mistake you say you're sorry you you, you do better when you know better and so um I think you know just putting yourself out there um, and, and the confidence will come. I, it, it's taken me a long time to feel comfortable and confident in, in who I am, the work that I do, the things I've accomplished um, too, and, um, and, and proud of, of that, that journey for me. And, and just thinking that, um, you know, what a great opportunity this class is, but but being a student at the University of Illinois, what a great school and how many doors that opens for you and taking advantage of, you know, for case, I, 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 you mentioned this already and, and I'm so, but please, you know, correct me if I'm wrong, but, but you have our, or Brandon has our email addresses. If you have additional questions or there are things that you, you, you're still wondering about or things, you know, that you, you do want some more in, input on I'm happy to be that in case it sounds like you you know you've done that before and would potentially be willing to do that again sorry again for speaking <laughs> on your behalf but I get that sense um, that, that you're really helpful in that way and so take advantage of whether it's me and case and Brandon or Bert or whomever take advantage of the people that want to help you because people want to help and people want you to succeed um, and and so so that's where that putting yourself out there making those connections working on those connections um, is so important and will get you so far in life. Yeah, it's it's one of those things where um, you can't, like in the present day, I, I could not have painted the picture of what I'm doing currently. Uh, I set very low expectations of moving from Champaign to the West Coast of California and making like a, a good life for myself, but like, the power of networking, the power of community. Um, I mean, I don't know. I don't know if it's the power of U of I, but like a lot of Illini have done some really interesting and uh, amazing things here on the West Coast. You know, out there on the East Coast with Case, and then in the Midwest with uh, you know where Ingrid and the students are. So, uh, you know, tap into those as resources. Um, I think pushing fear away and like looking yourself in the mirror and not necessarily looking to the left or to the right, uh, always battling against yourself and not externalizing. Um, I think we've we've got a lot of good food for thought from both Ingrid and from Case. So um, what I'd love to do now is if we could throw some cheer, pick your favorite Zoom emoji and, and throw some claps and some snaps in there for our special guests. I just want to say thank you, uh, Case. Thank you, Ingrid, on behalf of our class. And, um, you know, we're wishing you all the best as you uh, continue to forge ahead in, in business and in social impact. And uh, before we close it all the way out, Bert, I'll give you a minute or two. Do you want to uh, reflect any or uh, say any final words before we shut it down? Uh, no, I, I think we've tied uh, the bow pretty well today. Perfect. So um, I guess on behalf of Bert and myself uh, and the Siebel Center for Design and the university, uh, just thank you for, for your time this Thursday evening, Thursday afternoon. Uh, students will put some more uh, stuff into Canvas for you all to check out uh, over the weekend. Uh, may your Super Bowl dreams and fantasies come true <laughs> this Sunday. We'll see what happens. And uh, like always, just be safe, take care of yourself, uh, be good to others, drink water, mind your business, all that stuff. We'll talk to you all next time.